Welcome to the CEO series. Our guest today is Jermaine Dow, Associate Vice President, Human Resources, Latin America, Canada, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Our topic, managing your brand during disruptive times. Our conversation will be centered around careers, career transition, branding, and what it's like to work for a major sports league in this time. So with that, I thank you. Welcome. Welcome to the CEO series. And our guest today is Jermaine Dow, Associate Vice President of uh, Human Resources for Europe, Middle East, Africa, Latin America, and Canada. That's a large portfolio. My goodness. Our topic today is going to be centered around branding, career, career transition, and what it's like to work for a major brand. I say brand because we're not going to really get into the NBA and what's happening on that side because there's been a lot of things that's happened over the past few days and we're not going to go there, you know, with that. So uh, with that, Jermaine, welcome. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Good, good, good to good to be on. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, I've watched this from afar, obviously, and uh, I was I was elated to get the invite to come on and and catch up with an old friend. So I, I was going back thinking how long it's been since we've uh, initially connected. <laughs> quite some years. So great, great to be here. Yeah, quite some. I think when you were with HBO at that time, I think that's when we first connected. Uh, but it's good to have you on. I apologize for last week, uh, the couple of weeks ago, because we had technical difficulties. But I wanted you to come on because you work in an interesting environment. There's been a lot of disruptions uh, going on, um, you know, over the past month or so. But for, from a career perspective, what is it like to work for a major brand? I say brand because I'm not going to specifically tie it into the NBA. What is it like for, to work for a major brand? Because lots of times when people see, oh, my God, you work for XYZ and they're excited. Give us kind of a, what is it like to be there in, yeah, in that you know, industry? No, it's, it's a good question. Um, you know, and, and I, I would say beyond the NBA, HBO and other places that I've been, um, you know, it's almost this dynamic where you're Jermaine from the NBA, Jermaine from HBO, not just Jermaine, right? Yes. And so you're in a room and, and folks want to talk about, you know, especially now with the NBA, folks want to talk about, well, what's happening behind the curtain and who's yeah. the goat? Is it LeBron or is it, is, it, <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it Jordan? Is it Bill Russell? And those are the conversations that typically happen. Um, but look, you, you embrace it. Um, it is, um, you know, it working for a brand like the NBA or even an HBO certainly comes with its its share of responsibilities. Um, you know, um, but but we embrace it and uh, it, it's it's pretty exciting. Um, mm. You know, for me personally, getting the opportunity to merge my professional and personal passion with a huge sports fan, specifically basketball. Um, you know, I was the guy prior to joining the NBA, I was the guy that read the collective bargaining agreement for fun, just, just so I can one up <laughs> the fantasy basketball. So um, that convergence of personal and professional passion to me is uh, uh, pretty cool. But it's, it's, it's exciting. It's exciting. It has its nuances. Um, as you see, as you've seen within the last, you know, several yeah. weeks, yeah. particularly yeah. within the last 48 hours, but mm. very exciting. Yeah. yeah. Based on the, the disruptions that you've experienced over the, I'm going to say the past year, what are some major learnings that you've taken away from that? Um, no, I appreciate the question. Uh, first, let's let's talk about the disruptions, right? Because I okay. think, and I'll, and I'll use this word that's been so overused, but I use it anyway, unprecedented. <laughs> okay. Right? Um, we're, we're in unprecedented times. You're talking about... Um, COVID-19 in the last several months, you're talking about social justice, and then you're talking about the economic fallout of COVID-19. Mm. So there's this trifecta that um, business leaders, HR leaders, um, employees, the entire world has to has to grapple with. Um, you know, so 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 that's that's first and foremost. And you know, some of the things that I've that I've, I've gleaned in terms of um, disruptions and just observation, um, 
brands, both in the, both individuals and companies need to be flexible. Mm-hmm. Need to be flexible, need to be uh, agile. Um, leaders in particular need to be uh, need to be agile and also yes. empathetic, right? Um, you know, I, I think I shared this with you when we spoke previously. I saw a cartoon, on, I think it might have been on LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago, uh, the guy sitting in, in a room and his wife is standing behind him and he's it's like, wait a second, am I working from home or do I live at work? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think that's what the whole world is 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 grappling with in some mm-hmm. some you know some form or fashion. So when you think about that, what that means to our day to day, it requires the entire entire ecosystem to be to be you know agile and be flexible and be empathetic. I mean, how many video calls have you been on in the last six months with dogs and cats and kids running in the background and yeah. Um, yeah. and it's it's set a new norm for us on, on what it's like to just carry on professionally uh, day to day. So, you know, again, that agility, flexibility, um, you know, being empathetic uh, and, and also over communicating. You know, communication is something, as you well know, Ron, it's tough enough to get it right when you're together in an office in person, yeah. let alone yeah. in a virtual setting, uh, mm-hmm. globally, right? Yeah. Um, and so one of the things we've realized and we we're, con- we're not there but we're continuing to, to, to keep at it is over communicating um, <laughs> because what generally happens is you know and in our business and you, you asked about what it's like to work at, at the NBA or I should say in a, at, at a brand like this in our business 48 hours is a lifetime yeah uh, and if you don't say something in those 48 hours um, folks filled that silence with their own thoughts uh, yeah. and so yeah. you've got to keep the cadence of communication even if it's we don't have much to say you've got to say something Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but those are those are the things that i I would say you know sort of initially jump out to me okay yeah you know you you mentioned leaders because i do a lot of work with leaders across the globe and i see that some of them get it and some of them don't so you're talking about agility and all these kinds of terms but i see a lot of leaders that may may have been great leaders prior but going into this new normal, they're not going to survive it. I was talking with a leader the other day, and he was concerned about, he said all of his people are home watching Netflix. And I'm thinking, how did you arrive at that? But that's the thought he has of his workforce. Mm-hmm. So from our perspective, and I say from human resources perspective, when you mentioned leadership, what do you see is kind of, if we have to go back and maybe change a leadership dynamic, and produce a better level of leaders. You mentioned some key terms around agility, uh, empathy. How could we think through that from old leader, I say old leader has passed, and new leadership competencies moving forward? Wow, loaded question. <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> um, look, I'll, I'll just say, you almost have to work backwards, right? Which is which is really diagnosing um, in the current state of affairs and frankly, what it looks like it will be for a long time to come. Um, you know, uh, meaning having to live with, with COVID-19 and, um, and its knock-on effects. You almost have to start with what makes the most productive uh, sort of, what, what, leads employees to be their most productive selves, be in a good mental space or mental place, um, have the right mental well-being. Um, what does that take and then work backwards? Okay, okay. okay. Um, and, it'll, uh, and, and I've, you know, we've, I've had a number of discussions about this with, uh, within the organization, uh, with external colleagues, folks like yourself. Um, and it keeps coming back to empathy. Yeah. Right? And, and pausing for a second and understanding that the, you know, stylistically, the approach to communication style, resources, um, you know, everything that it took to get you to this point as a leader and as an organization, mm. it takes something different in most cases to get you to that next step. Yeah. Uh, and it keeps going back to, 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 to empathy. Um, and I think that that's, that's, the, that's the key term um, mm. that, that requires a different perhaps a different leadership tone and, and style, which is why I think you're seeing, Ron, uh, 
folks who've traditionally been known to be strong leaders and good leaders, uh, if they'll admit it, many of them are struggling in this in this new normal. <laughs> yeah, um, if they will admit it. Key point: self awareness. Are you willing to diagnose, self diagnose to say, you know, maybe I need to change my style? And if the leaders are listening in on the call, this is the thing, what, what, what we talk about a lot. Self awareness will bring about a lot of improvement if we really with a clean lens, look to see how am I failing? How am I connecting? What could I do differently? You know, that kind of a, a transition point. And Rob, um, Rob, sorry, let me add one more thing that I think is important. Um, I think considering all that we're facing now um, as individuals, as leaders, as, as, a, as a society, it's okay on occasion to say, I don't have the answer right now. Yes, yes. yes. I don't have all the answers. I know I'm the CEO. I know I'm the chief HR officer. I know I'm the chief communications officer. Um, but I don't have all the answers right now. Yeah. But we're yeah. keeping at this. We're putting, you know, we're we're putting the things that matter first. And I think oftentimes that's that's what folks, you know, employees, society, that's what yeah. they want to hear. Yeah. 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 Um, Again, that could be a side discussion that we could go on and on and on about. So talk to me about your thoughts when you were approached and said that you were going to be, you had the offer, opportunity to leave New York and move to London, which, where, which is where you're now based. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you know, I, it's, it, I, I often throw people off because they're like, oh, you're based in London, they expect a British accent, and then I, I let them down. <laughs> Uh, but it's only been it's only been two years in London, so uh, I know I have not picked up an accent. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, some of the inter interesting observations. Um, you know, if I'm if I'm being honest, you know, New York coming from New York, um, New Yorkers tend to be a more direct with their communication style. Yeah, um, <laughs> very very direct. <laughs> very very direct. So that was an, an adjustment for me because I'm generally direct, yeah. Uh, but I had to read the room, read the new yeah. atmosphere, read the new yeah. environment, and yeah. and you know, uh, as I made my rounds and got acclimated, meeting with leaders, meeting with employees one on one, uh, it took me it took me a while to realize um, they're not being as direct, and yeah. so yeah. I had to adjust my approach and decipher. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and really, really break down. Well, what, what was behind that? What are you trying to say? Yeah, and meet yeah. them in their comfort zone to actually, mm -hmm. you know, sort of break down the lines of communication. And obviously, being there over time and getting to build a personal relationship certainly help, helped. But that 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 directness versus indirectness uh, um, in the UK was 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 something that uh, that I noted. Um, you know, and then there's the obvious stuff, obviously, you know, from a from an HR practitioner standpoint, just the differences in, you know, labor law and, and, and yeah. processes and procedures, and, you know, that goes without saying. Um, and the other observation, and again, I don't know if this is a function of just New York pace and being fast moving. Um, <laughs> everything moves at lightning pace in New York. And I know, and, I know, what, I know where you're going with this one. <laughs> <laughs> not, not so much in, in the UK. And, uh, and it was, I realized it wasn't just an NBA thing. It was, it was a yeah. UK thing. Um, yeah. you know, I'll give you a simple example, but, um, you know, New York, you get an email and, you know, and, and the expectation is I need to respond to this email within 24 hours. Yeah. It wasn't said, but that's the expectation. Uh, my first, you know, few weeks there, I'd send an email and, you know, and, a week might go by, I might not get a response. <laughs> and so again, you know, took some getting used to and yeah. sort of setting yeah. expectation and understanding how things uh, differ, but, um, but you know, came up to yeah. speed and, yeah. and it's, it's, it's fine. Everything's yeah. working fine, but it, it, was a, it was an adjustment. Yeah. You know, I can imagine because when I, when I read through your bio and I saw that you were, you know, you're in so many different markets um, you know, across the globe, you know, from Canada to uh, Middle East, uh, Europe, and um, each country or each region has kind of their own quirks, if you could say that. I've lived in Saudi Arabia, and I live in Dubai, and I'm back in New York. And so it's kind of an adjustment you make in trying to read what's going on. 
Definitely, definitely. And, and those offices, and I know, let me just say, it is, a, it is an unusual setup, um, but, you know, uh, we, we're an unusual business to some yeah. degree. So, yeah. um, so we, I have the configuration and the remit that I, that I do. Um, but you're, you're spot on. Uh, every office, every region has its own uh, mm. subculture, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it's, an, it's actually very important because your ability to understand that subculture yeah, allows me as an HR leader um, to not come off as tone deaf mm -hmm. and not understanding mm -hmm. how how you know what matters in that particular market. So, yeah. um, I, I won't single anyone out, but you've got some regions where very sort of familial culture um, really care deeply about each other, um, uh, truly a team, uh, and then you've got other re other regions and offices um, that are you know a bit more fragmented, still you know great mm -hmm. performers, but don't have that level of camaraderie, personal camaraderie that you may yeah. see elsewhere. So it's understanding those nuances that actually helps me be uh, even more effective in in, in working yeah. with teams. Well, you know, that comes back to what we were talking about before, you know, the, you know, the self awareness and to be able and comfortable in saying, I just don't know, but I will get back to you, you know, because um, I've always kind of figured that it was a lot of the, the ills inside of organization is this imposter syndrome and everyone is trying to make sure they know everything because they don't want to their teams to, to kind of get a uh, look through a crack to say they're not as smart or they're not as adapted as to what I thought it was. So self-awareness is, so if any leaders are out there, take some time to think about who you are and the impact you're having on people. One of the other lines of, uh, of discussion I wanted to talk about, so you're very big in developing people, mentoring people, early career professionals to a lot of young people. What do you, what do you how do you have those discussions now when someone may be graduating probably in the, it's not probably the worst economy ever. And they're trying to get back on track. Yeah, I'll get to that question in a second. I just want to quickly wrap up the prior discussion, which is, and I don't know if I'm coining this for the first time or, or someone else already claimed it. Um, but, you know, it's my belief as a leader, a healthy amount of vulnerability is a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, 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 and going back to your comments about, you know, uh, or the discussion about not having all the answers. Mm -hmm. um, again, a healthy amount of that um, yeah. Is, yeah. Is, is okay. Um, mm -hmm. And teams, teams notice that, they appreciate it, they respond to it. And I, I found that it actually uh, builds closer relationships and, and camaraderie. Okay, okay. Uh, to, to your question, um, Look, I'll break that down into several different areas, um, you know, in terms of how, you know, how I'm counseling and coaching and mentoring, um, you know, student, you know, recent grads, young professionals, in some cases, uh, folks who are well along in their career um, in, in and out of the HR space. Uh, you know, there's there's the program programmatic things that we do, obviously, internship program, associate program, um, those interns, those associates, they you know, graduate and from the program and move on or they stay with the organization, but that mentoring relationship still exists. Yes. Um, you know, they still sort of reach out and, you know, in an informal way, um, it's not a formal engagement, but they still reach out and say, hey, look, you, you've known me since I was a young pup in this business. Mm -hmm. so here's what I'm thinking. I'm struggling with this. How do I approach this? And so I'm having those conversations almost daily in some okay. form or fashion. And not just from folks at the NBA, but people I've worked with at HBO, people I've worked with prior to that, yeah. um, people I've not never worked with, who I've just encountered in professional settings. Um, uh, so there's the programmatic piece, right? Which is just, again, a daily, weekly engagement. Um, you know, and, and what I've also found is, whether it's early career or folks that are well along their career, much of it is, <laughs> helping folks understand how to align their interests or I should say their interests and passions with, with their skills. Okay. Um, that, that's a big part of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, helping them find that intersection. Um, so, you know, authentically, what do you, what do you like? What is it that you're passionate about mm -hmm. that you would do for free? 
if it came down to it, right? Um, okay. Does that align with what you're doing now? No. Then I can see why you're having some problems. I can exactly. see why you don't feel motivated <laughs> waking up every day to go to work. I can see why you don't feel fulfilled or challenged. Um, and it, you know, it's, 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 I'm, I'm oversimplifying obviously, but, um, that thought process allows them to really break down and decipher, you know, some career choices and options that may actually yeah. be better suited for their default skill set. Yeah. You know, um, you know, so a big part of it is, is, is that, um, particularly for young professionals, the other thing is, is reinforcing for them what's possible. We all have those self doubts, yeah. you know, we yeah. all have those doubts, uh, you know, do I have the right skills? Am I going to be accepted? Um, did I go to the right college or university? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and so it's it's reinforcing for them in conversation as well as highlighting, uh, you know, those who who made it and say, look, yeah. this person. You know, it's the old saying, right? If you can if you can see it, you can be it. Yes. Um, yes. Spotlighting that and reminding folks of those 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 possibilities. Um, you know, the other thing is. Be yourself, you know, be authentically yourself. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and if he ever sees this, he, he might give me a little bit of grief for bringing this up, but I'll bring it up anyway. Um, my former boss, uh, CHRO here at the NBA, I remember his first day, you know, addressing the entire HR team, big personality came in the room and said, I got to warn you guys, I'm an acquired taste. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, I've, heard, I've heard that term before <laughs> you know um it's i've got to warn you it's going to take some time to get used to me and yeah. everyone sat back in their chair and what is this guy talking about <laughs> um but in the subsequent weeks and months and, and years um you know we 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 when you see the same person year six that walked in the building year one or day one um, there's power and value in, in that. And that's what yeah. I mean by being authentically yourself. You can fake yeah. being someone else through an interview process. Yeah. Maybe even for a few weeks, maybe for a couple months, but not indefinitely. Um, exactly. You know, and so I often encourage folks to, to you know, be authentic um, to yourself because th therein lies your uniqueness and your value. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it either fits with a particular organization or manager or leader um, or, or does it, right? Okay. Um, and then the last thing is, is, you know, whatever it is that we each aspire to do, there's someone out there that's doing it already and doing it in a very high clip and doing it very well. And so how do you align yourself with that person? How do you mm -hmm. build a relationship? Uh, you know, gain try to get access to that person and be a sponge. Uh, and again, that holds true for not just early career, uh, folks are, are recent grads, but folks who are 15, 20 years in their, in their career, they're, they're the reason that CEOs have mentors, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, the coach mentors, needs, coaches. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. The coach needs coaching. Um, and that never, then that always holds true. So, you know, those are the, those are the, the, some of the things and the ways and some of the conversations I'm having to, you know, to try to, um, to, to sort of coach folks along. Yeah. You, you know, uh, my daughter lives in New York City. She's uh, and she's kind of in the career transition mode. And it's funny you mentioned that that intersection of passion with skills. And, you know, lots of times when you talk to your kids, that's like, yeah, 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 dad, I, I got it. You know, we had the same conversation. And she says, well, my thoughts on my career is a little different than you. I said, OK, cool. But exactly what you just said. So I think when people are disrupted, their careers are disrupted. They look for a job when they should step back and look for what the interest lot where the interest lies and you bring those skills to overlay that and and in the end it will all work out a lot better than you just trying to find the next job with the next salary and then two years in or one year in you're sick of the choice you made and um you're trying yeah, to figure no, out a hundred percent and you know i'll just share a little bit on a, on a personal note um I remember being at HBO, getting a call. Somehow my CV made it to, to HR at the MBA. I didn't know anyone there. Um, but, you know, this is what I mean by being authentically yourself. Uh, one of my uh, recruiting colleagues at the time knew I was a massive sports fan, huge NBA fan, heard me talking about it all the time. Um, and, you know, he, he said to me one day, hey, heard about a job that I think you'd be 
perfect for. And I was like, what are you doing, man? I'm happy here at HBO. I want to retire here. Yeah. And it's like, no, if I know you, you're you're going to want to have this conversation. And lo and behold, it was the NBA and, um, you know, went in and had the conversations. I remember getting the job, um, you know, calling my wife saying, hey, I got the offer, <laughs> you know, let's talk. And her first reaction was, well, I'm happy for you. So you're going to tell me you're going to watch basketball every single day now and then legitimately tell me you're working? Um, and, uh, and my answer was yes. Um, you know, but again, it was that convergence of yeah. personal and, and, and professional uh, passion and being able to be in a space in sports and in media entertainment that I follow just intellectually and from a curiosity standpoint, I follow it anyway to now being immersed in it, working on it. Yeah, uh, trying to help leaders actually run their business. So, um, yeah, it's been it's been it's that that's really really important that that sort of intersection. Okay, cool. So, Lauren Thomas, if you're listening, um, this is what I was telling you about. Maybe you'll you, you'll take it because Jermaine said it. <laughs> so, you were recently named 40 Under 40. I know the Network Journal very well, uh, out of New York, and each year they look at 40 people. Who, uh, and they honor those 40 people for the work that you're doing, um, both professionally as well as uh, offline. Can you talk us through that? Uh, what kind of, you were selected. Give us some background on the 40 under 40. Yeah, it's a phenomenal, you know, publication, you know, slash organization, but publication that that is exactly what you just said, you know, recognizes, you um, you know, predominantly pe people of color um, who are, you know, doing things and contributing both professionally um, and, and as well as, as within communities. Um, and, uh, you know, someone I went to college with uh, is, you know, involved with the publication and said, hey, look, you know, I, I, I think I think you've got everything it takes to be included in this group and yeah. put me through the nomination process and you know, um, fortunately, I was selected as, as, as one of the 40 under 40. And, and, um, and also, uh, not only that, but selected to be one of the I think five or six people featured on the cover issue, uh, okay. the, the cover of the issue, and which was a phenomenal experience, just just meeting, you know, like minded individuals, yeah. uh, uh, again, the, you know, um, black and brown folks, uh, yeah. and to be in a room of you know filled with such talent and optimism and hope uh was yes. just yes. absolutely phenomenal so um you know in terms of the process so, so let me just say i'd be remiss if i didn't say shout out to mr aziz who, who runs runs the operation there and uh, uh a friend of mine jr and the entire team there that's responsible for this it's a massive massive undertaking mm -hmm. and they yeah. do a fantastic job it is yeah. talent. um yeah. With, with, with not a lot of resources and to pull off what they pull off is just absolutely incredible and to be, uh, to be uh, admired. Mm. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll share one of the quick story associated with, with, with that, um, which I think is um, worth sharing. So, so the magazine comes out, it's fantastic. I'm on the cover with a few others and, and whether you may not know this, but I, I, I shy away from that stuff. I don't like it. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. embarrasses me. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I, I, I got a few copies of the magazine. I, you know, I had one on my desk, but I turned it down. I turned yeah. the face down, the cover down. Um, yeah. uh, uh, and my, my, my boss, my CHRO uh, at the time, um, like I said, big personality, you know, he was so proud of, of me and uh, literally went through the hallways in the office, you know. Telling uh, everybody. <laughs> telling everyone, um, which naturally embarrassed me. Yeah. And there was a woman who's been working with the NBA for, you know, for 20 some odd years uh, in a very high profile role. Um, and she came to my desk and she said, hey, I heard you were featured in this publication. You know, I kind of downplayed it. And I said, yeah, it's a little thing. And, and she said, young man, let me talk to you. <laughs> and she said, let me see the magazine. So I showed it to her. She said, can I borrow this for a day to read through it? I said, absolutely. She pulled me into her office and she said, Jermaine, you're a humble guy. I can tell. Not challenging. Yeah. 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 She said, but I want you to remember something. 
this being selected for this, being on the cover of this magazine, most of it is actually not about you. Yeah. It's actually about the next generation and people who are marginalized and live in certain communities and don't even believe that something like this is possible mm. uh, for someone who looks like them. Yeah. Uh, so I want you to take this back to your desk, turn the cover up <laughs> and be proud of this. And, um, and I, I, that was a very, very powerful yeah. uh, moment for me. And if she ever sees this, Leah Wilcox, um, thank you for that. I, I will yeah. never forget it. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, uh, so anyway, you, you're, you're, you're back to your original question of sort of the process got nominated. It was a great sort of dinner and fundraising event. Uh, you know, family, friends, colleagues um, of, of all the nominees were there and just a magnificent event. Um, uh, and something to be to be a part of. Uh, mm -hmm. Incredibly proud, proud of it uh, to this day. Well, you know, I, I have a similar story because Cranes New York Business did a had a, a conference, and I was the keynote speaker. So Cranes is kind of a bigger magazine at that time, and uh, they put me on the back cover of the magazine. It was myself and three other people that were going to be speaking. I was riding the subway. And I see this woman reading the magazine and she keeps looking up at me and I'm thinking, what is this about? <laughs> you know how you are on the subway. Okay. You're thinking, what is this going to be about? Mm -hmm. And finally, she takes the take magazine coverage. She says, is that you? <laughs> so the entire car looked around. I was so embarrassed and I, I didn't even know it was there. But I said, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, that is, uh, you know, and that was it. Let me get out of here. So to go through that, but that's great um, to be recognized for the work you're doing and not only for the job, but the title, but for what you're doing to give back. And what the young lady said, the fact that it's inspirational for another group, a subset of people who can look and see you there and said, there's a possibility that I can do that. So that's why visuals are always important. Always. I, I, absolutely. And, you know, back to one of the prior questions about how we're mentor, how I'm mentoring, how I'm coaching, how I'm, you know, contributing to, to, to the next generation, you know, some of it is not even uh, direct contact or conversation. Some of it is exactly this, yeah. accomplishing yeah. the things that you've accomplished and just being a visual representation of what's possible. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big part of it as well. Yeah. So there's a lot of uh, disruptions in the entire sports industry, not only NBA, but NFL, hockey. I saw something this morning. Um, the workforce around that. So everybody is not a star. Everybody is not a LeBron on the course, but there's other workers who could possibly be looked at. You probably could not find them on an org chart. What is the difficulties of, of, of trying to manage that process? And I don't know, I, think the, I don't know the makeup of the NBA, but you have stadiums across the country and you have workers there that were probably disrupted. Any insights or major, not, without going into what you can't talk about, any uh, insights as it relates to that, that workforce that's aligned around the NBA? Um, yeah, also, look, it's one of the things that's, that, that I found fascinating about the MBA's corporate structure is, um, is I should say about the MBA is exactly the corporate structure, right? You've got the league office um, that is really tasked with the governance of the 30 teams uh, in terms of the on-court product rules and regulations. I would, I would, I would liken it to the best comparison I could probably think of is, is you know, sort of what FIFA serves as for the international, uh, the global okay. football community, right? So that's one element of it. But then there's also a partnership from a, from a commercial standpoint and efforts to grow the game um, overall. Right? So it's a, it's a very um, matrixed sort of uh, structure. Um, but you're right. And look, the, the 30 teams run and operate as their own sort of independent clubs and you know they all have their own stadiums etc um so the, the yes there are employees that work as part of that 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 organization that team organization either employed by the, the team or they're you know through a vendor or a third party uh in some in some respects um you know and if i think what you're getting at is 
you know, that's all been disrupted by not having live events. Mm -hmm. uh, right. I think that's, you know, within the sports industry, I think it's pretty easy to see that's been the biggest disruption, not being able to have fans in arenas, in stadiums, yeah. and, uh, yeah. and the knock on financial and economic impact to those workers who now there's, you know, there's no stadium or, or arena to attend to. Yeah. Um, the folks in concession, ticket sales, yeah. merchandising yeah. opportunities. Um, and even aside from the, you know, you, there's a production broadcast uh, element of it, um, you know, and so there's there's just this massive knock on effect um, that we as a league, for, as a, from a league office perspective, from a team perspective, uh, as HR practitioners, we obviously have to help the organization navigate through all of that. Um, mm -hmm. Whether it's furloughs, layoffs, um, being creative and innovative about how to retain that talent, how to do right by employees. Yes. Um, yeah. So yeah, um, but we've spent a lot of time sort of you know focused on that. Okay. Okay. Cool. For someone who's look who's basically just entering into human resources, entering in their career, that would like a, a position you know, in the sports industry, I said the sports industry, I'm talking about everyone. How, can you give some insights as to how that could be possibly navigated? I know you mentioned internships or what kind of insights would you offer someone that's listening that would be like you? I'm really a fan of soccer and I would give anything to be able to work in that industry, sports industry. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's tricky, but obviously possible. And I say tricky because you know, there, there are not that many sports franchises and organizations if you really consider the totality of it, right? Yeah. At least in the U.S., you've got the four major pro sports. And then even you go outside of the U.S., you've got, you know, you've got, you know, the likes of Premier League and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but in total, in, in the in the grand scheme, not, not so, so these roles and opportunities are very coveted. Um, yeah. Because of that passion play, the other phenomenon that you have is, 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 for the most part, you know, a lot of folks who get those jobs, they rarely ever leave, yeah. <laughs> right? So, so the attrition <laughs> level isn't as, 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 as much yeah. as you see elsewhere. And so, um, you know, the outcome of that is, is there are few jobs and, and, and when they are available, they become very, very competitive and very mm -hmm. comfortable. Um, but but that shouldn't stop anyone from aspiring. Yeah. Um, I can tell you, I had no idea that I would end up working in sports. You know, being yeah. a basketball yeah. fan since the age of ten. Um, you know, not having grown up playing the game, uh, not having the height or talent to play the game. <laughs> um, if someone at ten years old told me, "Hey, there's another way for you to actually." be in the NBA and be a contributor yeah. and still be close enough to the game, I wouldn't believe you. Yeah. And so yeah. that's the that's the the headspace I would try to put someone in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, look, there there are tons of opportunities and, and a lot of it isn't just around I should say, let me rephrase that. When you get out of the realm of being close to the game, there are other opportunities, right? Okay. So whether you're whether you're you're really, really, you're a good analyst or you're mm -hmm. good at math or you're good accountant. Mm -hmm. um, guess what? All these sports yeah. organization needs that talent. Um, the support. Needs those support, um, you know, and then there are things you don't even think of or, or that aren't prominent, prominent at your traditional organization, things like capologists, you know? What what is a capologist? That's uh, my next uh, question. <laughs> those, well, those are those are you know really smart analytics folks um, that work with team presidents, general managers, uh, in particular, to figure out the salary cap and oh optimize, salary cap contracts. Yeah, yeah. How to okay. Optimize contracts, the salary cap, um, how to best leverage the the salary cap rules. Uh, and again, that's something someone may not think of. Um, yeah. but, you know, those opportunities exist. Um, uh, you know, so I, I shared that as one example. But, but back to your question, what advice would I would I give someone? Um, learn a network. And I know that's not groundbreaking. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, you know, you know, uh, but 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 it's important. Mm -hmm. Learn as in really understand that organization, you know, do your homework, 
Um, if you have in, an interest in a particular um, sport, franchise, um, or industry, you know, do your homework, learn. Um, that's that's really, really important. It makes you more effective, um, you know, in, in your job. And it goes back to one of the things I mentioned earlier, you know, there are people in the space doing it very well. And one of the things that I'm always surprised uh, surprised at is how much people don't realize there are people that are doing this that are more than willing to share their knowledge with you. Yeah. Yes. You know, more yes. than willing to sit down, well, a bit more of a challenge in these times, but maybe now get on a Zoom call with you. Exactly. Uh, exactly. And, and, and share knowledge about how they got into the industry, how they progressed throughout their career. Um, so those are two things I would I would certainly recommend. And the other thing is spot the opportunity, spot the opportunity. Sometimes there isn't an obvious position or role, but I can't tell you how many scenarios have existed where people landed jobs because they spotted an opportunity and reached out to a CEO, reached out to a head of HR reached out to a colleague and said, hey, you know, I noticed you guys have been struggling with this for the last three years. Um, and I gave it some thought. And here's here's a way I think we can address it. And I'm, I'm just offering this up to someone who's passionate about your league and follows the yes, sport. Yes. Yeah. Um, and you never know where that can end up. It shows, yeah. it shows initiative, it shows passion, it shows interest. And any sensible HR person or leader or manager may say, I want to talk to that person, have them come in. Yeah, yeah. Sensible HR person, because I've known some that you send up something like that too, and they, yeah, okay, they put it in the stack of everything else. Um, but then that's kind of a knock on our profession, um, but we won't go there with that. But, th but uh, so in closing, I want to ask you, you know, you do a lot of mentoring work and, you know, you're a key leader in the New York HR space. And now I'm in the, from a global perspective, there's a lot of people that's been disrupted and they're trying to figure out 2.0. In other words, the next version of you. Um, what kind of advice would you offer to those people if you had to sit down with someone and give some insights as to the predicament they're in now? to try to get back on track? You know, I, I think part of it you just addressed, you said get back on track. Sometimes yeah. it's getting on a different track. Okay. Um, you know, I think one of the things I've observed and, you know, obviously it's well-documented, um, many organizations, the MBA not exempt, um, have had to take action and, you know, and, 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 you know, whether it's layoffs or, you know, et cetera, salary reductions, et cetera. Um, and you've got folks who, you know, perhaps have been with the organization a long time and they, don't, they, they they've grown up with the organization. And so it's, yeah. it, you know, we don't underestimate what a challenge that is to after 10, 15, 20, 25 years, of doing something with an organization to just pick up and pivot one day that's that's challenging that's challenging mm -hmm. um but i i encourage those people to you know to, to bet on yourself there's value in that experience mm -hmm. there's value and there's a reason you've you've stood the test of time at generally speaking at that organization for as long as you have there's value in it and you've got to bet bet on yourself bet that you can either leverage that expertise, knowledge, and experience at elsewhere at another company. Or one of the trends that I've noticed is is uh, is going the entrepreneurial route. Yeah. And uh, and that's what I mean by betting on yourself. Yeah. Um, you put in 12, 13, 14 hours a day for, for an organization. Um, and and you know, what if you invested that time in your own your own business? Yeah. yeah. Uh, now that might I don't know if that's a popular sentiment, but <laughs> amongst HR practitioners, but uh, I'll you know we're we're having a candid conversation, and uh, you know, and I do offer that up as as a as a uh, another option for for, mm -hmm. for those folks. And mm -hmm. many times, you know, people don't think of it like, oh, yeah. wow, I do have value, I do have expertise, and I can actually you know, offer that to, uh, to, to, to companies, especially as they try to scale back headcount and sort of operate on more of an a la carte as needed, uh, mm -hmm. you know, basis. Yeah. Cause you've already built up a career set doing that. So you could possibly monetize that as one of the options of, of trying to get back on track or new track, as you just said. 
Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Um, you know, and, and, you know, the other thing is, uh, and I've seen, I've seen this play out um, with, you know, uh, people within this, the NBA and the organization. I've seen it play out with friends and colleagues of mine where, you know, they're just doing a complete pivot and, you know, going back to school and mm -hmm. you know, just getting into a completely different discipline. So I've been in HR for the last eight years or 10 years. Um, maybe I'll go get an MBA. Maybe I'll go to law school. Exactly. Um, maybe I'll go the entrepreneurial route. Maybe I'll <laughs> consult. Yeah. Um, you know, those are all options that I think it's hard when you're in it day to day. It's hard for you yeah. to step back, take stock, evaluate, yeah. and realize that that those are indeed options and they do come with sacrifice and, mm. and you know, and, and, and sweat equity investment, but um, viable options uh, none, nonetheless. Okay. Jermaine, thank you, my man, for yeah. this wonderful conversation we've had over the past 45 minutes, close to an hour. But um, I think people will walk away and get a, a, a lot better insight of disruption careers, managing careers, because you've had such an interesting career. And now I'm going to say pinnacle, but maybe not pinnacle. You know, maybe there's something above that. The, uh, you know, whatever, whatever 3.0 or 4.0 version is law school, whatever. But thank you so much. And hopefully I'll see you in London again. You know, we, we were in London last time and we, we hung out. And um, so hopefully in a few months or beginning of the year, we'll connect in London again. So thank you very much. No problem. Appreciate it. And looking forward to uh, seeing you in person again. Uh, have a good one. Take care.